I started my personal, my like the serious side of personal development, my personal development journey when I started actually pay, paying mentors, paying coaches, yeah. right? Uh, it started in March of 2019. I really started to take it serious enough to where I started investing money yeah. into personal development, right? Masterminds, coaches, mentors, you know, personal trainers, you know, things like that, right? The, the alignment of mind, body, spirit, you know, and, and I started that in March of 2019. And the reason why I started that is because I realized that if I really want to be this massively successful individual, right, in the likes of like a Tony Robbins and the likes of like a Manny Koshpin and the yeah. likes of an Ed Milet, well, guess what? Success will never outgrow the person. Success will never outgrow the individual. If you're not serious about leveling up on a personal level, mind, body, spirit, you are going to be in for a hell of a surprise and a huge letdown, by the way. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. There are people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. This is Jeff Lerner, your host. Thrilled, as always, to be here with you getting to have amazing conversations with amazing people. Basically what I would want to do anyways, even if I wasn't working and wasn't getting paid, and yet here I am getting to call it work. Today is no exception to that, joined by the amazing, wondrous Carlos Reyes. Carlos was smuggled twice into the US, which means I guess he was smuggled in and then booted out and smuggled back in. Got to hear all about that. Um, escaped severe poverty and abuse as a child. Incredible story. And he's gone on to create 27 companies, which sounds like it could just be an indulgence of ADD, except that he makes them work wonderfully. Seven of them have been uh, multi-million dollar companies. He started companies in medical, solar, education, and real estate. He leads uh, All In Nation, which is an incredible education movement. And he's also happens to be a really cool guy. Carlos, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Brother, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm excited for this one. I'm excited. I, you know, based off some of the information that you've told me, obviously, and based off some of the information that uh, Cartney, you know, my client's relationship manager, um, I'm, I'm excited to really serve today. So I can't really wait to bring some heat today, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, let's, uh, let's turn up the temperature, man. Um, so incredible story. Uh, you know, I think that everyone would probably... Uh, question my judgment if I didn't start at the whole smuggled in, smuggled out, smuggled back in. Like, what is that story, man? It sounds like a crazy uh, immigrant origin story. You know, it, it's it, it's almost unreal at this point, right? Like, every time that I have to, I, I I've said the story now. I've, I've probably told it. You know, not, I'm not at a hundred times or anything like that, right? I'm in like the I don't know, maybe twenty, thirty. You know, because I'm. I'm just really starting to get out there now, right? Like as far as on, you know, in the entrepreneur's uh, space, right? Because yeah. why I've dedicated, you know, the past, you know, half a, half a decade, um, wait, a decade is 10 years, right? Yes, it is, <laughs> right? I've dedicated, you know, the last five, six years and uh, just building, right? Building these companies, right? I, I didn't, while everybody else was out there, you know, doing whatever they're doing on a social media platform, I was grinding. I was yeah. building. I was focused. You know, I had my head down and I was I was pushing. So um, now that I'm starting to get out here. Right. Thank God. Like I was just on the Andy Frisella podcast and that was a beautiful thing. Uh, Andy's a great guy. Um, so is his brother, Sal. Amazing human beings, by the way. Um, I was on the uh, I just got off the Brad Lee podcast last week. Yeah. Uh, and that was a total blast, too. And now I'm starting to tell my story right now. I'm starting to tell my story. And it's, it's crazy because every time I tell my story, it, it's almost like I'm reliving it and relearning it. And, 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 and the beautiful part now, thank God, is uh, I'm not having to relive the emotions, yeah. right? Because I'm so past it now. Uh, I'm strong enough and I've healed 
and uh, I don't have to, you know, I don't have, uh, I don't have like PTSD from it. Right. And I believe that at some point I did, I had an actually, I had to dump a lot of money into my personal development. Um, I've done sessions with Dr. George Pratt, one of the leading uh, psychologists in the world. This guy has, has mentored uh, people like Tony Robbins and Rob Durdick and a lot of those people, Andre Agassi and a lot of those guys, right? This guy, um, he's out of La Jolla and um, mm. he's, helped, he's helped me, uh, you know, peel back the layers and, and get past a lot of the trauma. And people are wondering like, well, I mean, was it that bad, right? Was it that bad? Uh, you know, was your childhood that bad? And we're going to get into that. And, and it, it's not that it was that bad. It was just, you know, it was, it's something that I would never put any child through. And it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't intentional. It's just the cards that I was dealt, right? So with that being said, my story starts in, uh, in Mexico, uh, in a, a state called Sonora. It's Northern Mexico. And I was born, uh, I was born there in, in, in Sonora and, and uh, I was raised there for most of my childhood until um, my mom, you know, tr- uh, brought us to, to the U.S. And, and this is the way it started, right? I'm born in Mexico. I'm born into uh, extreme poverty. Uh, you can even say the slums, right? The slums of Mexico um, where, you know, I, I got, I, I got, I show them all the time. I got pictures of like the, the house that I lived in with uh, my grandma, my grandfather, you know, where it's like almost cardboard and some four by fours and laminate, you know, laminate roof. Um, and then, you know, I had to shower out of a bucket, right? I, I showered out of a bucket for the first God knows how many years of my childhood. And, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my gran- grandma had a, a washing board in the back and we would hang our clothes on these metallic lines uh, outside in the back. And then my grandfather built a, um, a house where, you know, we would use the restroom back there. I mean, it's, we didn't have like we didn't have a sewer system or anything like that, mm, wow. you know? So, uh, that's, that's my childhood story. Uh, you know, it's uh, dirt floors, you know, dirt floors. Uh, I don't think you ever seen dirt floors, but I lived in, you know, I've lived with dirt floors for, uh, like I said, most of my childhood. Um, I've, I've been, you know, I've, I've been, uh, I've walked barefooted for weeks, you know, cause we couldn't afford shoes. Mm. Um, you know, I, yeah, dirt floors, dirt roads, you know, most of the, the roads where I grew up were, there, there were dirt. There was no asphalt there. So, you know, to me, it was a very normal thing to grow up that way. Right. Because I didn't know, I didn't know what, I didn't know the world outside of that poverty. Mm-hmm. So I didn't think anything of it. And I think that, that that actually helped me, right. That helped me because imagine this, right. Imagine you're born into uh, poverty, but you know, let's just say you're born into poverty in America. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? Now you get to see like the blue collar, you know, uh, middle income, uh, America, and you get to see some of the, the rich folks in America. So then that could really take a toll on your psychology. Yeah. Right. Cause you're like that could see, I'm almost, I would say I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful that I did not see rich people at an early age because God knows what that would have done to my, that what that would have done to my psychology and my confidence. And, you know, right. Like you understand, like people, that's a real thing, you know, like, yeah self-worth and you know things like that that's a real psychological uh challenge for a lot of folks when when they get to see like this is where i am and this is where the rest of the world is well i didn't really have that uh i would say that option so that actually worked in my favor like this is where i am oh well everybody else around me is poor too so this is normal right so i that really didn't mess with my with my psyche um now when i was in the second grade uh, my mom smuggled uh, myself and my brother uh, through TJ, uh, sorry, San Isidro, which is a border near Tijuana, Mexico, which is also another border. Um, she smuggled us in through a sewer system. And, uh, and then we got, got thrown out. And then we waited two days. And then she then successfully smuggled us in the second time. And I only lasted, this was in California. You know how you say like, oh, you must've got deported. No, I didn't get deported. I voluntarily left because we were, we were pretty much homeless. We, we, we didn't, we, we couldn't make it in California. It was very expensive. My mom was a single mom working the fields. You know, that's how she got her immigration paperwork is through amnesty. And, um, you know, it just wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for a single mother to, to raise, you know, two kids in California. Um, the, you know, just the bills weren't, we couldn't yeah. pay the bills, man. That's all it really was. So guess what? We worked so hard to get to America. It was absolutely devastating to leave voluntarily because we knew that when we left, 
it was going to be so difficult to get back. Why? Because me and my brother were illegal aliens at this point, right? So what we did the first time, my mother had to pretty much unintentionally abandon us with my grandma, right? I'm, I'm, I'm five years old. I'm four, I'm five, you know, I'm six years old. And guess what? You know, my, my, she had to leave us. So imagine now you're dirt poor, right? You're, you're poor. You're, you're really poor. Then you're the one parent that you have. Uh, and, and, and again, I had two parents, but my mom left my father voluntarily because he was abusive, right? He was into drugs. He was into drinking and he was beating my mom uh, pretty frequently. So we ran away from him to my grandma. And um, then she, my mom had the vision of, you know what, my kids, they're not going to make much out of themselves in this poverty, in this situation. So I'm going to sacrifice everything to get to America so I can give my kids a better opportunity, a better opportunity at a better life. So she unintentionally abandoned us for about a year and a half with my grandma. So I would, I remember I was five years old and I would, I would have her picture uh, under my pillow and I would cry at night because I felt like, where's my mother? You know, imagine being five years old and you're just crying. Like, where's my mom? Is she ever going to come back? How come I haven't heard from her? Right. You're five years old. And you know, these are things as a child, man, that I don't wish that, like, I have two daughters. I have an eight-year-old daughter. I have a two-year-old daughter and they're my, they're my babies. They're my princesses. You know, I would never put them through something like this. Right. And, and I'm not saying that my mother did it on purpose. Remember, she was just trying to do what she could at the time. Right. So now we have the psychological effects and the emotional effects of abandonment. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm like before we even before she even took the risk of coming to America, I was I was going door to door selling bread to save up enough money for her to to come to America. And she was working at the resorts um, at San Carlos Bay Resort you know, getting cash tips in American dollars, cleaning rooms and hotels, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, between me selling door to door, you know, selling bread door to door, and her, um, you know, working at the resorts, we saved up enough cash, and then she left to California, Escondido, California. And after, you know, a year and a half goes by, um, she makes enough money. And again, she smuggles us in, right? And then we got caught the first time, got thrown out, uh, got thrown out. And then we uh, successfully, uh, you know, contrabanded in the second time. Now we're in California and, you know, okay, she has a little apartment um, and, you know, she's, uh, she's working her butt off. And my brother and I, we had to, uh, at that age, you know, five, six years old, um, we had to watch ourselves. And so what she would do is she would pick out four movies, right? And most of them were of Jean-Claude Van Damme. I, I clearly remember that was one of my childhood heroes, right? My childhood heroes were like Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, Arnold, um, uh, who else was, was he, uh, Rock, uh, Sylvester Stallone, right? right? So what she would do is she would pick out four movies because four movies would normally get, get her through the shift. So we would just, she would just say, Hey, you know, when this movie's done, put in this movie, they're all rewinded. It was VHS at that time, mid nineties. Right? right. So we didn't even have a babysitter. Like we couldn't even afford a babysitter. So my brother and I had to watch ourselves in an apartment. Imagine leaving two children at that age to watch themselves, right? That's pretty scary, man. Like, yeah, I, would never I mean, do I, I got to imagine you weren't in like the nicest neighborhood. Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. But you know what? Doors locked, windows down, don't answer the door. Uh, we, were, we were definitely survivors. We were ahead of our time for sure. So anyway, a year and a half goes by. We fail financially in California and man, like that was the toughest, that was the toughest trip back right now. Like one of her friends, um, excuse me, he has this little black truck, this little black Nissan truck. And we put all our belongings there. And I remember that long drive, man. I remember that long drive from California back to TJ where other family in Mexico was going to pick us up. I remember us just being defeated. Right. I remember just being, I mean, we just went like from the land of milk and honey back to dirt roads and dirt floors, right? But now, now we know of this other world. Yeah. Now we know of this world that has asphalt roads and beautiful buildings and, and grass, like green grass and good food and, and nice clothes and beautiful cars. Now we know of this other world. So what do you think we're thinking on the way back, right? We're defeated, yes. As soon as we get to Mexico, I'm in the, I'm in the fifth grade now. 
as soon as I get to Mexico, as soon as we get to Mexico, her and I come up with the plan. All right, mom, you're going to work in the resorts. I'm going to bag groceries now at this retail store and we're going to save up enough money. And now we're going to go to another state where the economy is a little more affordable, Arizona, right? Yeah. Where the economy is a little more affordable. And now you're going to bring one child at a time. You're not going to bring both. You're going to bring one child at a time. I'm the oldest. So you're bringing me first, whatever. Sure enough, man, I start making tips, man. I'm making like $10 a day in tips, right? Bagging groceries, taking them out to their carts and boom, right? I'm getting the tips now. I got my little apron. I got my little, uh, sorry, I got my little apron. I got my little hat and you know, I'm, 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 I'm cashing in brother. I'm making more money than my mom was at this point on tips, bagging groceries, right? So we save up enough money together and we put her on a bus. She comes to Phoenix, Arizona, and now it's another year. It's another year before she saves up enough money to bring me over. Now she saves up enough money. She brings me over and she, she, she pays $25 to a coyote. A coyote is an individual who contrabands illegal aliens into the country, right? Mm -hmm. So she says, hey, uh, I'm going to be on the other side waiting for you. Listen to this man. When he tells you to duck, you duck. When he tells you to run, you run. And when he tells you to jump, you jump. I'm going to meet you on the other side. So sure enough, man, Nogales, Nogales Sonora, right? I'm, I'm with this guy and I'm doing whatever he's asking me to do. And he, he, he's like, hey, let's go through this hole. And he, we go through this hole in the fence. It was a lot easier back then to get into the stage, believe it or not. So we go through this hole in the fence. And then she meets me at the McDonald's in Nogales, Arizona, which is America. And then she brings me up to Phoenix, man. And I, you know, um, it took us, she immediately starts my paperwork process, right? She, uh, she immediately starts my paperwork process. Uh, 1997 is when she started my paperwork process to become a legal, a, re a permanent resident of this country. So, man, we, we couldn't even afford it, but I don't know how she did it. Like she was always, she was always a hustler. Like, I got so many good personality traits from her. She was always a hustler. She was a visionary. She sacrificed. She was committed. She worked two to three jobs at a time. You know, my mom was Wonder Woman, right? So um, she started, she saves up enough money, starts putting in the paperwork through immigration. And sure enough, man, it was a pretty long, um, long process and it was expensive, but I get my work permit first and I'm, I'm happy, right? Because I was illegal most of my life. I'm happy. I get my work permit first and then I get my, uh, uh, my permanent residence. And then, you know, six years later, I become a, a citizen. I take the test and I become a citizen of the greatest country on this earth. And I hope it stays that way. Um, so now, you know, I'm, I'm a citizen. And, and, and again, now, now I'm, I'm starting to write, write my own story now, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I started writing my own story. So what I do, yeah, I started grinding. I started working, right. I started, I worked in corporate America. I, I worked my way up very quickly from, you know, shift manager to assistant manager to manager in training to the youngest manager in, 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 in the organization at that time in their organization. Um, at, you know, I'm 19 years old. I'm already managing people. Um, and then I become a district manager and then a regional manager. So I really, I was the ultimate yes man. If they told me to go to Seattle, Texas, California, uh, no, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, I'm there. I'm there. Why? Because that's how I was, you know, that's how I was raised. I'll work 70, 80 hours a, a week. I don't care. Right. Pay me overtime. I, I'm, I'm, I'm into that. Like, let's mm -hmm. do it. Right. Uh, you know, I actually got mad with them one, one time because they told me I couldn't work so much overtime. So I'm like, they were taking that away. They're like, you can't work 20 to 30 hours a, a, a week in overtime. And I got into an argument with my vice president at the time. Cause I'm like, what am I going to, I'm not 50 hours a week for me at that time was like a part-time job. <laughs> right. I'm thinking about it. Right? I've been working all my life as a child. I'm like, I need at least 70 hours a week or I, I got to go. So she thankfully she agreed. She's like, you know what? OK, we'll, we'll give you 20 hours a week in overtime. Let's do it. So, brother, I was working 10, 12 hour shift Monday through Saturday all day long. Right. Like clockwork. Hmm. But anyway, I worked there 10, 12. Uh, I think it was like 12 years. And, uh, you know, I was still dead broke. I was making 70 K a year. And. To me, that was a lot of money because, you know, where, where I come from, that was enough money, you know, especially in this economy at the time, right? There was enough money for me to start, you know, buy, you know, bought a, bought a house, right? Bought a house, um, 
uh, and then I, you know, I bought, you know, got a car and my cars were pretty old that I could only afford like 10 year old cars. Um, I bought a car, um, you know, and, and, you know, me and my wife now, like we've been together since we were like teenagers. Um, you know, it, it was enough. She was working. I was working. She's paying half of the bills. I'm paying half of the bills. Right. That's all I could really afford. But I was still living paycheck to paycheck at 70 K uh, a year. You know, I'm not a good saver. <laughs> I'm a good money maker, but I'm not a good saver. Uh, so I was living paycheck to paycheck and I'm like, you know what? Like, this isn't what I imagine as an adult. I, I imagined me having my own business. I imagine being financial free. I imagine living the life of my dreams. I imagine retiring my mother. You know, I imagine my, you know, my kids not having to struggle the way I did. So then brother in 2014, I made the decision of, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start building something for myself. And my mind, my mindset shifted, my mindset shifted. And I'll tell you what, I read a book called secrets of the millionaire mind by T Harv Eker. Yeah. You probably are like, I got it. I got it somewhere. Right. Yeah, so it's around here somewhere. Oh my sure. God, bro. I read that book brother. And it just, Game I could, yeah. I could, it just resonated with me. I could relate to it. Right the programming, the upbringing, you know, all that. Like, I was like, yes, this is me. This is it. And I just, you know, you know, you know, the way God's timing works, right. is such a beautiful thing. And let me tell you why. Here I am. I am uh, about 12 years in. I'm the ultimate. Yes, man. I am one of the head honchos in this company and I'm at 70. I'm making these people 250 K a month, right. I'm producing 250 K a month for them in, in, in gross revenue. And yet they're paying me 70 K a year. Right. And, and then, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to get this position that I've worked towards for four years. I'm supposed to get this position. Four years I've worked my butt off for these people. And then it's time to get that next position. And I would, I would have went from $70,000 a year to $110,000 a year. Right. Which I would have been the first person in, in my family's history to make six figures a year, right? Mm-hmm. So that would have been, I would have been the most successful person. I was kind of already the most successful per seventy k a year, right? And then they screwed me. They, uh, the guy that was supposed to give me, like, I, actually I earned that position because I did everything they asked me. I was the only guy training for that position for four years. So the guy that was, I was supposed to replace, he decides to give it to his cousin. That was like, I was ranked number one. That guy was like a total... He wasn't serious, right? And he was like rank 17th. The guy gives it to him. They screw me. I'm devastated. I'm now in a state of depression. And they asked me to, they're like, hey, take a break. One week pay, you know, uh, grief. It was like a grief, grieving pay or something. Right. They're like, I'm so sorry. We screwed you. Take a week off, right? Go cry about it. And brother, I was, imagine like working 12 years. And somebody says, sorry, right? Sorry, like, yeah, bro. Like my whole, like they, they pulled the rug from under my feet, right? So anyway, I, I just start like going, I, I went into a depression, but man, God started talking to me and he was telling me the reason why you didn't get this position is because this is not what, I have in mind for you. This isn't what you're supposed to do. You've already done this long enough. You've already learned so much being in this position, right? Because I didn't go to college. So mm-hmm. I, what did I learn? I learned hiring. I learned systems. I learned processes. I learned develop, developing other employees and putting them in empowering positions and you know delegation and everything on a management scale, right? I didn't go to school, but guess what? 12 years worth of that, I learned a lot, right? Mm-hmm. I learned about KPIs and goals and metrics, everything. So I'm like, okay, I come back, but I, now my mind has shifted. I'm like, I'm never going to leave my life in the hands of someone else. And I, I speak to my vice president. I say, Hey, listen, um, I just want to say this. I want to, I want to take a demotion. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, I could only work the hours of seven 30 in the morning to three 30 in the afternoon. I can't work seven 30 to seven 30 PM now. Right. And they're like, well, what's going on? I thought you, you liked overtime. I said, well, 
I'm going to start trying to work on leaving this job. They're like, what? How are you going to do that? Well, you know, I don't know yet. I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to figure it out. I said, I'm going to figure it out. I can give you one year. I can give you one year. I I'm committing to one more year. Like, okay, whatever. So I started working 7.30 to 3.30. And then as soon as I would get off, as soon as I would punch that clock, man, I was, I was like, I've always wanted to be a real estate investor, right? And it's like, well, you know, I always had, I always had the, the mind frame of, well, how can I be a real estate investor if I'm, if I'm broke? Mm -hmm. I have, you know, I have no money. I have no experience. I have no credit, right? I have no credit. And well, you know, I got a good enough credit score, but guess what? My, my, my uh, debt to income ratio is through the roof. So no one's right. even going to give me, no one's going to give me a loan anyway. Right. So what can I do? Then I learned about this thing called wholesaling, real estate wholesaling. Well, what is real estate wholesaling? Real estate wholesaling is literally just finding off market discounted properties, negotiating with it, with those, with those prospects, those homeowners, putting them under contract and then partnering up with somebody who can actually close on that deal. Now I'm the bird dog. I'm finding the deal, right? right? I'm out putting bandit signs. I'm out, you know, knocking on doors. I'm out, you know, putting out flyers. Like, brother, when I tell you that I became obsessed, I became obsessed. And you have to be. If you're not obsessed with what you have committed to do, you're going to fail. Like, you're not going to make it. Any little roadblock that presents itself, you're going to quit. Right. You're not going to make the sacrifices. You're not going to be committed. Um, you're going to pick and choose when and when, when and where you want to do this, et cetera. Now, when you're obsessed, when you're obsessed, nothing else matters. My, my habits, you know, going to the gym for three hours out the window, playing basketball for an hour or two a day out the window, hanging out with my family for one to three hours out the window, right? Everything, all the side, you know, bad relationships, toxic friendships out the window, Right. Mm -hmm. I focus, man. It's like I just zoned in. I had laser focus and I started grinding and it took me six months to find my first property. And then I found my sixth property, my first property after six months and twenty four hundred bandit signs. You know what bandit signs are? I do. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm out on Friday nights, 11 p.m. Boom, 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 boom. Next corner. Boom, 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 boom. Right. Well, guess what? After I, after six months and 2,400 bandit signs, I land my first deal. I partner up with the guy. I literally just made $5,000. I'm like, Hey man, I found this great property. Can you buy it? He made like 40 K 30, right. 30 or 40 K. Right. And then uh, I'm like, okay, I got a $5,000 check. I'm like, I've never seen this money in one check ever. Right. So what I do, I invested that $5,000 into marketing and then I, 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 I send what's called direct mail, right? Direct mail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I land three more deals in the next three weeks and I made $60,000. And now I'm like, what the, I just made $60,000, man. It takes me seven. It takes me a whole year to make 70. I just made 65 K in the last 30 days. Right. I still didn't quit my job by the way. And I'll get into that. Right. Cause I was very scared. You know, I, I my, I was very scared to quit my job, you know? So, I put that 60K back into another mail campaign and now I make 30K. So now I'm at $90,000 from two mail campaigns and $5,000 from putting out bandit signs. I'm at 95K in like 45, 60 days, right? This is 2015. And then I start saving. I got deals in the pipeline. I save up about six months worth of reserves and I'm like, I'm out. Right. I told these folks, I, I, as soon as my year hit, I remember it was like my birthday, 2015, March. And I'm like, Hey guys, I'm out. I'm quitting. They're like, what? Yeah. I'm, I, I got money and I got money put away. I'm, I'm going to go build my own company. Right. So sure enough, you know, I'm gonna go build my own company. And, and, and I left that job and brother, the first year, which was 2015, you know, we, we did very well. We did over half a million dollars. But 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, you know, 2020, obviously, we hit multiple seven figures, multiple seven figures, right? I'm actually looking at my expenses from 2019. Right now, I'm not at my 2020. I'm looking at my expenses from 2019 or what I've spent on just real estate marketing alone. I spent $1,077,858.75 uh, in just real estate marketing, not even like payroll, not even 
-hmm. not even uh, uh, expenses like overhead, you know, like we bought this building, we bought this building in December of 2019 for a few mil and uh, we rehab this building and it's a beautiful building now. I'll have to show it to you soon, right? But again, you know, we hit the ground running, brother. And you know what else we did when we started making all this money? We started to buy other companies and we started to build other companies. And that's how we got to 27 companies. That's how we got to 27 companies. We're like, okay, well, you know, let's, uh, let's build a data company. Boom. Let's build a digital marketing company. Let's build, uh, let's build a, a solar company. Let's build a medical company. Let's buy this other medical company, the competitor. Right. And we just start, we start dumping, you know, money. Like I bought this, uh, this medical company last year in July uh, for like 300 K cash. Right. And, and it, it gave me, it gives me a really good return. It's a, it's a, it's a medical company for, uh, for diabetics you know, insulin, uh, reservoirs, uh, meters, strips, all that, right? So we dump money there and it's been a phenomenal journey, man. And here I am now, you know, here I am running, you know, 27 companies. I got a great organization. I got great leaders, great people, great partners. And, you know, it's been, it's been a good, it's been a, it's a blessing. It's been an absolute blessing. My life went from one side of the totem pole to the other side, right? Like, and yeah, the, don't get me wrong. The in between was, the in between was definitely a uh, uh, a lot of trials and tribulations, but it's become my testimony, you know. So here I am. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> it's an insane story. I mean, congratulations. Thank you on brother. on having that story. You know, all parts of it. I mean, yeah. they all they all made you who you are. I'm sure you have really no regrets. Um, so, so let me, if, if I could kind of dig into pieces of it, because it's, it's inspiring for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it gets instructive as we get into more specific pieces of it. Absolutely. Right? Um, so how, first, if, if, and I'm asking for narrative purposes, not just to be nosy. How old are you? 36. You're 36. Okay. Um, and you came here... First of all, actually, I just have to share with you an insight uh, as you were talking. Uh, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind is like one of my favorite books. I've probably read it five times. Amazing. Um, I keep, in fact, I keep the 17 wealth files in a note uh, on my phone that literally, for anybody who's seeing this on, um, on the YouTube version... I literally have it right here. I mean, it's like, I can pull it up in a second. I have the 17 wealth files on my phone at all uh -huh. times. And I literally, sometimes I just reread them like to remind myself how to be, you know, it's so powerful. And, and my insight is that as you were sharing, I was thinking about some of the wealth files, you know, I create my life. R rich people think I create my life. Poor people think life uh, life happens. Life to happens you. for me. Yeah. No. Yeah. Rich people are bigger than their problems. Small people or poor people are smaller than their problems. Rich people focus on opportunities. Poor people focus on obstacles. Uh, rich people are committed to being rich. Poor people just want to be rich. Rich people play the game to win. Poor people play not to lose. Like on and on and on. And as you were telling the story, I was like, you know what? Yeah, you grew up poor, but from the way you describe your mother, she had a lot of rich person tendencies. Oh, bigger right. than her problems. Doesn't just want things, but she commits to things. Thinks big, not small. Focuses on opportunities, not <laughs> obstacles. Like, right? So, because because when you first tell your story, it's like, man, how did this guy get to be the kind of person that could think so big and take this kind of action? But, dude, you grew up around it as My hard mother, as it was. Brother, absolutely. And you know what's crazy is, um, I uh, I spend. And people are going to think I'm absolutely insane, maybe, but I spend about ten thousand dollars a month and uh, with a personal development coach, not only for myself but for my eight year old and uh, my wife, right? My third grader and my wife. And I'll say this: I'll say this on air because I have nothing to hide, right? So uh, I have a coach out in Florida. Uh, her name is Tanya Oliver. You can look her up on Instagram. She has red hair, um, and you can ask her. You know, I don't care. I'm, like I said, I don't hide anything, right? I spend a lot of money on personal development. I do. I do, and. The reason why that is, is because I know what it did for me as a child, right? I, I actually did what's called some shadow work um, over the past uh, 45 days where I had to take 
my mother and her personality traits, good and bad. Then I had to take my father's, right? And take his personality, good and bad. And then I had to take six flaws in their personality and six flaws in the personality. And then I have to take them and put them in front of me. And then I, I, then I'm like, holy smokes. I grew up with all those flaws, all those flaws. See, this is what people don't understand that most of our subconscious programming happens from the ages of one, two, to about seven, to about seven, right? And some people say it's between the ages of five and 12, which could also be correct. But nonetheless, it happens when we're children. And where does our programming come from? More than likely our parents, our parents that are right there. In my case, my parent, my mother, right? And yes, you interact with some teachers and, you know, the pastor and a couple, you know, some uncles and no, but guess who you're looking at all day, every day, right? right. Your mother or your father or both. And, you know, they, they lead by demonstration. They lead by the, the words they use. They lead by the way they talk to you. Well, my mother, um, this is one thing that I just noticed as an adult, by the way, it's funny. You just mentioned that brother. I just realized that like 30 days ago <laughs> that, my mother had vision. My mother, my mother had commitment. My mother had perseverance. My mother made the sacrifices. You know, my mother had the work ethic, right? So guess what? I am a product of that environment subconsciously, subconsciously. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And oh yeah, totally. If this didn't happen by accident, I had a great role model who still doesn't speak English to this day and never made more than 825 an hour, right? But it doesn't matter. Because that's not, that's not what programming, what programming was her actions, her behavior, her words, her never die mindset, right? Her spirit. That's what programmed me. And that's why for all the parents that are listening out there right now, they better start paying really close attention to their actions and their words. Because guess what? 24 hours a day, their children are paying attention to what they're doing. OK, so remember that parents out there, because I'm very careful with what I do around my children for that same reason. I'm very careful with the way I approach my children. I'm very careful with the kind of love I give my children. Right. And, and most importantly, obviously, the, the programming, not only do I give them programming, but guess what? I have a coach for my third grader. I have a coach for my third grader. So yeah. that should tell that should tell people out there how important programming is. That could. Your programming could define your entire life, the good and the bad. So keep that in mind. And thank you for observing that, by the way, because I, I just realized that like 30, 45 days ago. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it leapt out to me. But again, you know, and it's funny, like even right before this conversation with you, I was interviewing someone else who uh, was literally, his name's Raphael Eliasson, who was literally working as a janitor. He got out of school, dropped out of college, the only job he could get was to go back to his old high school and get the job as a janitor. So he's literally cleaning the bathrooms while his old teachers are using the restroom, looking at him going, oh, so you didn't make much of yourself, did you? Should have oh. stayed, stayed in school. Just like, and he was, he was overweight and he was addicted to video games because it was the only place he felt safe uh, was in this virtual world because he was so scared of the world. And you know what he did? He started listening to Jim Rohn tapes wow. and he started watching Tony Robbins seminars and he started working on himself up here. He started deconstructing that old programming that didn't serve him. You know, the reason T Harv Eker calls them wealth files is because they're the files that are installed in the operating system. That is your brain. And if you want to change your brain, because you want to change your life, you need to reprogram it with different files. I right? love it. And it's, it. it is so true. You know, I, if, if people, you know, you never know what people are going to take away from any one episode of the show. And I never know where the shows are going to go, but if some people take anything from this and all they take is personal development is not some woo woo thing that I should, I should, you know, discard. In fact, if I make personal development, the most important thing in my life for one year, the entirety of the rest of my life will look completely different. And you, you agree with that, I'm sure. I, I agree, brother. I started my, um, so I, I started, I started my personal, my, like the serious side of personal development, my personal development journey when I started actually pay, paying mentors, paying coaches, yeah. right? 
Uh, it started in March of 2019. March of 2019 is when it started, right? Don't get me wrong. Yeah, there, I always had influences around me, which were great, you know, in business and stuff. But I really started to take it serious enough to where I started investing money yeah. into personal development, right? Masterminds, coaches, mentors, you know, personal trainers, you know, things like that, right? Because the physical side is also part of the, you know, personal development, right? The alignment, mind, you know, body, spirit, right? So, uh, uh, and T. Hart talks about that a lot. So the, the alignment of mind, body, spirit, you know, and, and I started that in March of 2019. And the reason why I started that is because I realized that if I really want to be this massively successful individual, right, in the likes of like a Tony Robbins and the likes of like a Manny Koshpin and the yeah. likes of an Ed Milet, well, guess what? Success will never outgrow the person. Success will never outgrow the individual. If you're not serious about leveling up on a personal level, mind, body, spirit, you are going to be in for a hell of a surprise and a huge letdown, by the way, because next thing you know, life has just passed you by and you didn't grow. So therefore you didn't achieve. So keep that in mind for everybody listening out there. You need to start taking your personal development more serious, more serious. You got to have the commitment and you got to have the discipline, right? The plan, because this is the way I see it from my experience now. Um, I would say discipline leads to habits. Discipline leads to habits. And then habits lead to transformation, like life transformation. But it starts with discipline, right? It's like, okay, commitment. I'm going to be committed to having discipline, right? Because, you know, that's a, that, that's a whole, like, hurdle on its own. Commitment, discipline. Oh, my habits are starting to change because of the discipline. I'm starting to eat better. I'm starting to, I'm starting to read more, right? I'm starting to get out there and network more, right? So commitment, discipline, habits, and then life transformation. That's when transformation really happens. This is something that I've learned from the past five, six years in business, uh, and, you know, obviously dumping uh, money into my personal development journey. And brother, I'll tell you what, my goal for next year is to dump between 250K and $300,000 into just personal development, masterminds, coaches, mentors, you know, things like that. Why? Because I know the ROI, the return on investment. I know what happens. A lot of people, they don't do it because why? They feel like, oh, you know, I'm not really going to get a return, well, guess what? The return is your own growth. And then your own growth leads to what? More success. So people don't really understand that, right? They, they don't live in that world, that, that, that energetic world, that invisible world. They, people need to see physical stuff. If I got right. the money, I want to see a physical return, right? You will get to see your physical return. You'll get to see it in yourself. And then what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to go out there and be a, a peak performer. And once you're a peak performer, the, the you know, the, the life is limitless. Like, you know, there's no, there's no uh, bottleneck. Yeah. That, I, I, that's the thing, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize, you know, there's so it, it's all, here's the thing, guys like us that like are hardcore into personal development. It's all, it's almost all cliche at this point, right? First you make your habits, then your habits make you, you know, Jim Rohn said, don't wish it were easier. Wish you were better. Right. Mm. Like there's all this, this stuff. Uh, you know, even Aristotle, well, it wasn't Aristotle. It was Will Durant writing about Aristotle said, uh, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not a virtue, but a habit, right? Yes. Um, but, but, you know, what, I, what, what, what escapes me sometimes, I forget because I spend so much time talking to guys like you, is most of the rest of the world, they're not, they're not in on this stuff they're so not. much. And, not. and we do, I think we do a great service when we advocate for this way of living and this way of self-development, you know, you're right. People want to put money in and they want the money to send more money back out, like a, like an annuity or a, you know, like a, a flipping a house or something. An right. Investment. An investment. Yeah. But, but it's, that's not how it works. It's like, it's more like lifting a weight. You don't lift a weight so that the weight can lift some more weight. Mm -hmm. You lift a weight to get strong. So it makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. So the next time you can lift more weight. That's all personal development is. It's literally, it's weightlifting for your brain. I love it. 
I love it. And I can tell you this, um, people don't understand the importance of, you know, mindset and, 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 and the spiritual realm. They don't understand that. How can you ever see beyond today? How can you, you know, how can you ever see, you know, my mom has an old saying, she's like, she's like, most people can't see past their nose. Right. And I was like, what does that mean? Well, most people can't really see past today. Right. They don't, they don't see tomorrow. They don't see three years from now. And, and, and what they don't understand is when, when you make an investment into improving yourself at every aspect of life, right? Because success isn't just a monetary thing. It's like a health thing, a love thing, you know, a family thing, you know, it's like a monetary thing, right? Success is a, it's a huge, it's a huge graph. It's not, it's, you know, it's a huge graph. It's not just like, oh, I'm rich, so I'm successful. Oh, you know, there's guys out there that are rich and are miserable. You know, there's guys out there that are rich and they're, they're drug addicts. There are guys out there that are rich and they have broken families and, you know, you know right? There's, there are guys out there that are rich and, and they're not respected. They have a shit reputation. So people need to stop really the, you know, mis, misleading on what success is. It's not just like, oh, I have a jet, I have a car, I have a business. That's not, that's, that's just one small fraction of what success is, right? So the way that this happens with the personal development thing is you make an investment. It's like investment in commitment out, right? So if I make an investment into my personal development, then I'm kind of, I'm going to have to be committed to improving myself. And that's what, and it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to do what I do, right? Spend 10 grand a month minimum on my family on personal development. You can start by buying a, you know, a $20 book, right? Right. This is a $17 book or, or whatever. You know, what is this one? And, and uh, by the way, Todd Herman, I had him on my show. Somebody can go watch our interview for free even. That, brother, I just found out about Todd Herman and uh, amazing conversation, dude. It was so good. So brother, good. He, he's, so he's, he's actually, he's actually having me look into alter egos, hmm. right? Cause what happens is when you, when you start to get very spiritual, um, you, and, and, and conscious, you start to suppress or deplete that ego that got us to, you know, our animal self, like, ah, right. right? Like, you know, that, you know, that ego that, was pride and, and arrogance and competitive and, you know, and, and all that. Right. Well, when you start to get rid of that ego, now you're like, well, shit, what am I going to do to keep scaling? I just got rid of the, you know, the beast, right. I just got rid right. of that ego. Right. The no one can touch me. I'm the baddest in the room. Right. That's, that's a, that's a, that's all ego, by the way. Right. right? That's all ego. So what I'm going to have to start doing now that I've really suppressed that ego is I'm going to have to create alter egos. Right. When I throw on my jacket, you know, and I come into my building, well, guess what? I'm going to be, you know, Carlos, the businessman. Right. When I walk through the door at my, in my house, I'm going to be Carlos, you know, the husband and the daddy, the, you know, like super dad. Right. So I'm going to have to start creating some alter egos. I'm going to leverage my egos. What I'm saying, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to create alter egos and leverage those egos so I can continue to climb. But without all the junk, you know, without all the toxicity that, the other ego that got us here, you know, that ego, right? Um, it's something that I've had a tough time detaching from over the past two years, but uh, it, it's been a beautiful transition, you know, to just reflect. I'm like, I'm not that person anymore, right? I'm not that competitive, toxic, unhealthy, envious person, right? Even though that person, that ego served me to a point where like, I guess what, I, I survived, right? I, I was in survival mode and, you know, and then I went through a status phase of, with that ego. Like, hey guys, look at me, I've arrived, right? Look at what I drive, you know, look at, look at my Rolls Royce, look at where I live and look at the money in the bank. And brother, I was walking, I, I was so stupid at some point, like <laughs> I was buying all kinds of junk and, you know, watches and jewelry and, and I would have like stacks of, you know, I don't know, 20, 30,000, like a, like some kind of rap star at some point, you know, right. that, that, that's, uh, that's when I was going through the status phase. Right. And I had to really get rid of that ego in order for me to be where I am today, because guess what? I wouldn't have Joe Marion's phone number if I was that guy. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I wouldn't have spoke at thrive, right? I want to be on a stage sharing the stage with the likes of like an Eric Thomas and, and all these amazing, wonderful people right? Ty Lopez and, and all those guys and Tom Billyu. Well, guess what? If, if I was still that old guy with that, with that ego, I wouldn't be at that. I wouldn't be able to share a stage like that. 
Yeah. You, this is what I'm saying about the ego, right? And that's obviously someone should look at the interview you had with, with Todd Herman or they can YouTube, but ego is real. And we have to outgrow that ego. You, and we have to outgrow it to elevate. We do have to. And that's something that's funny that you bring that up now about Todd Herman, because that's something that I've, I've had a tough time, you know, I, over the past two years, getting rid of or detaching um, because, you know, people are stuck with some of that junk, yeah. you know, it's so. Well, especially when you've had to fight as hard as you did. I mean, yes. You know, yes. When, when you're pushing hard out, that force also embeds things deeply in. Absolutely. You're pushing against yourself and it, and so it takes a while to extricate it. I'll share with you on a, you know, kind of personally, how much I, I connect with exactly what you're saying. Um, when I started my business Entra, there's a little bit of insight for the audience. Um, it was, it was about two and a half years ago and I'd been going through a pretty challenging personal time where I kind of had that same experience you're describing of like, uh, you know, I, I've kind of, I've got enough status. I've made enough money. Like I'm, I'm good. So what is it that's going to push me to scale? Cause I did a bunch of therapy and from 2016 to 2018, 2016, my little, uh, I have four kids, but I adopted the older three. So I never got that first year that it was about the first two years when I adopted the other three kids or when I met their mom, the youngest was two. So I had never had the first two years of life with okay. a baby. So in 2016, I had, we had our fourth kid who's ours biologically. We had a baby girl and I yes. was, I was committed. I am going to be home and experience those first two years of life. And I did it in, t in two years. I only went to the office maybe two or three weeks. Love it. And I had a, I had an Inc 5000 agency at the time. In fact, we had our two best years when I was hardly there. Um, but, but so I spent those two years focused on that. And it was like, Hey, I got money. I'm a good dad. I've, I've done a ton of therapy. I've let go of a lot of that ego, but it was like, I have this itch. I want to get back in the game, but I don't have that same, that uh, same drive, that same yeah. animosity, right? Yeah. It's not a, it's not a, I, I'm, I'm not willing to force it anymore. Mm -mm. I'm, and I'm, and I, I did the same thing as you, by the way, I literally $10,000 a month. That was the number I hired a coach and I did some work. And I realized, cause you asked that question, you're like, well, what is it that's going to push me to scale? If I don't have that, that, that f kind of fear-based energy anymore. Yep. And what I, what I, the, the, I 100%, I fully 180 would into, I'm not going to do anything for me. It is going to be entirely about service. And look, I'm not saying this in like some BS, you know, watered down pseudo, you know, utopian way like i make money i'm an entrepreneur if i didn't make money i wouldn't be a good entrepreneur yeah but i'm gonna go entrepreneur as a verb in service to others mm. and it's that's all i've been doing for the last two years i made the most money i've ever made in the last two years and that was starting from nothing starting just by putting videos out to the world did all that alter ego i call it my success character came up with these characters figured out who am i here who am i there how am i here how does it all stay congruent with who I am deeply internally, even my scared little inner child, whatever, and just started shedding baggage, shedding layers, put myself out there, made hundreds of videos, got heckled, got laughed at. I mean, shoot, I got a, I got an email. Does it just for anybody that's like, Oh, what's the worst that can happen when you put yourself out there? I got an email at 2 22 PM, two hours ago from somebody that says, Jeff, you low life piece of shit. Eat a turd. <laughs> That's just a little little comment on YouTube that they messaged me. Like, oh. I took it all. I still taking it two years later. And God, I'm free. I'm free. And every day I wake up and I just serve. It's why I do this show. It's why I built Entra. It's why I love my family. It's why I get up. It's, well, here's, here's what I've turned into or, or what, it, what it's evolved into for me. Maybe this is of, of value for you is that the greatest service because you, we both know you can't save everybody. No. There's not enough fish in the world to hand everybody a fish. Mm -mm. But you can teach everybody to fish. And you can serve. You, you can, can serve everyone. Yeah. yeah, you can inspire everybody to learn to fish by being the best damn fisherman on earth. And so for me, I want to be, I'm 41 years old. I want to be in the best shape I can possibly be. 
I want to be the best husband I can possibly be. I want to be the best dad I can possibly be. I want to be the best interviewer I can possibly be. I hired a coach to help me learn how to interview people so that I could start this show. I want to build the best education company. I want to be the best, the best, the best. I want to be the investor. I want to be a billionaire. I am shedding all ceilings in my life because it's the best way I can serve the world is to inspire them and go, hey, look, he did it. And for you, shit. You grew up on dirt floors. I didn't grow up on dirt floors. So what's it going to show people if you do it? That's, yeah. that's beautiful to me. That they have no, I can't they have no excuses. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, and they, and, they, and they can't blame someone else or something else. Yeah, exactly. And That's a huge... But here's a, the thing, you can't tell them that. You just have to show them. Uh, you know, yes, you're right. You're right. But I think some people need to hear, not directly, not directly by name, but some people, I, I, I believe seeds do need to be planted um uh, there's a lot of people that uh you know they're the part of the non one the people that are not one percenters right um there's a lot of people that need to hear the fact that you have to take accountability for yourself you can't blame other people or other things you just can't like you gotta just 99.99 percent of what who, who we need to blame when things happen is us and People like that. They, they don't, they don't do that. Yeah, you're right. You can tell, you, you, you can tell them and you do need to tell them, but you can't tell them if you're not also showing them or else it's just yeah. demonstration. Yeah. Lead by, yeah. Lead by example, demonstrate to them. Absolutely. And, and, you know, you just said something that, that really sparked something. So we were just talking about as entrepreneurs, we go through this like survival phase first. Then we all, we both went through like status, like a status phase, right? with our egos and things like that. And then now you're like, you're operating from a, a place of peace, a piece of, you know, I don't need anything. I don't need anyone. I, you know, uh, but it's like, Oh man, I don't really have that, that animal instinct that I did when I had the, the ego and all that, but it's kind of a beautiful thing now that you, you found some alter egos and, and, and you're, you know, you're, you're pushing yourself to be the best in every single way, right? The best version of yourself. You want to show up to, you know, your family, business everything well i believe that you and i are uh at a place of significance now right so you got you got survival then you got status and then you when you reach significance that is yeah. when life is beautiful right a place of significance right where you're serving and, and, and you're not really you're not really driven by money anymore you know it's like or you're not driven by fear anymore. Now you're like, you know what? I am a person of significance and I want to serve others. You see? So that, that is, this is a and, great, and by the way, significance, the root of that word to signify, you have to signify, you have to stand for something. You have to signify something. I love it. Significant. So I'm curious that, by the way, that's, that's amazing. Uh, survival status, significance. It's I'm something totally, that you just sparked into my brain right I'm now. I'm stealing you know? that shit. That's good shit, man. It's good. I, I just, you, when you said that, I'm like, damn, I kind of went through the survival and then <laughs> I went through status and we're both in a, in a place of significance now. So I'm know? curious, do you, you, you mentor a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs with your, yes. your all in program. Um, and obviously I do too. Do you think that personal development in, you know, done insufficiency could shortcut the status phase and just allow somebody to evolve directly from survival to significance, or even to yes. just evolve straight to significance without even survival? You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. You, you are observing that because I can tell you this, most of my mentees, they're not going through a status phase. They're going from survival to significance. Mm. They're going from survival to significance. They're not going through, through that disgusting phase of like, I'm the man, look at me. You know, remember, look at my car and look at the money and look at my success, right? They're not having to do that. Yeah. You know, they're not having to do that. So yeah, a lot of like personal development helps with that for sure, for sure. There's brother, how many people do you know, right? How many people do you know that never make it out or never make it past that status phase. Right. They attach, they attach their entire identity and significance to the status phase, right? And, and, and when you don't make it past that, you stop growing, you yeah. stop growing. 
So a lot of people I, I get grew, stuck I grew in up this. around it. I did not grow up on dirt floors. I actually grew up with very successful parents. My dad was a money manager. My mom was an attorney at a big five law firm. God but bless I went you. To, I, went to, I went to a private school and I, I had a lot of kids whose parents, a lot of friends whose parents never outgrew the status phase. There you and go. divorces. I mean, you could, you could, you know, the kids, with, my friends would come to school sometimes. You could see it on their face. Oh, my parents were fighting again. And, oh, my parents are, you know, they're in, they're in Singapore for three months. They're not even going to see us. That's because they're just, they're just living the life, even yeah. neglecting their kids. Yeah. It's, it's sad. Yeah. You know, and I love what you said about how money is just a, a small, small Fraction. piece of it. it and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that sound, here's the thing. That's so hard to accept though, when you don't have money. I know. Cause you know, it's crazy when I, when I was dead broke, right. Even when I had my nine to five job, I was still dead broke. And by the way, I want to say this to the audience, right. Since 2016, you know, how I used to make $70,000 a year, right? right. Since 2016, I don't remember the last time that I made less than $70,000 in a month. Right. So that should tell people how you can go from again, one end of the table to the other, you see, right? And, and, you know, just like you were saying about like people uh, that are dead broke, like I was dead broke. So I remember, right? I remember what it was like to not have money. And guess what? People that are dead broke and have no money think about all day, every day. Money. Money, of course. I don't think about money. I'm not even driven by money. Like I'm not. And that's another thing that we have to discuss is like, when you're not driven by money, it's kind of a disadvantage, but then it could be an advantage. You see what I'm saying? It's like, it's, you well, know, it's, yeah, you have to find something to be driven by that still requires a lot of money. I realize what that is, by the right. way, at my, at, at my level now, I realize what that is. Are you ready? I love to be challenged. I love to be the smallest guy in the room. I love to be a beginner in a new venture, right? So I just realized that not too long ago. Because I'm like, man, no one's really challenged me anymore, right? Or I'm, I'm not challenging myself, you know. I, we're making eight figures, you know, eight figures a year with, with our companies, and you know, we're we don't need anything, we don't lack anything, everything's fine. We have our, you know, dream cars and dream homes, and we we can take dream vacations at any, you know, I, I can leave tomorrow if I wanted to, right? And everything would be fine. So what am I going to do to keep challenging myself? Well, guess what? I, you know, that same room that you were in, I was in too with the Ty Lopez deal and the Grand Cardone, right? Yeah, yeah. I need to be around those kind of people more where I'm the small guy. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the, they're the nine and 10 figure people and I'm like the eight figure guy. And, you know, it's like, I'm not doing anything. I'm still playing small, right? I want, that actually fuels me because I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm coming for you, right? I'm coming in a positive, healthy way. Yeah, of it's funny. We were both in that room. We're talking, I think that was before I hit record. We're talking about the clubhouse app. Carlos and I were both eavesdropping on a conversation last night with, you know, some hundred millionaires. And, and, and some yeah. of those guys, yeah. 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 I, I, and I felt, this, I thought the same thing. I'm like, you know what? I don't, here's the thing. I'm not the guy that wants to like raise his hand and go, me, me, me. I want to, I want to be in the conversation. It's like, no, no, I, I want to go, I want to go earn it. This is my, my, I'm admitting some of my competitiveness. I want to go earn it to where they're calling me. Hey, Jeff, we need you in this conversation. You know what's crazy, brother? Um, Cole Hatter and, and Cody Sperber brought me into that room uh, earlier on, not, not, not late last night, but earlier on, Cole Hatter, you know, because yeah. he's been to my operation and I, I love that guy. He's, he's such a great human being and so is Cody. And they brought me in. They brought me into the room and I'm like, and then uh, Cody sends me like a, a text kind of making fun of me. He goes, oh, you're a big boy now. He's like, you're in the room with Ty Lopez and Grant Cardone. But, you know, I'm not impressed by those guys. I'm inspired by those yeah. guys. I'm not impressed. Brother, if you look at my, if you go to YouTube and go to Andy Frisella's uh, episode 81, Manifesting Your Dreams. Yeah. You, you can tell I'm not impressed by Andy. I'm not impressed by him. Guess what? I'm inspired by him. I respect him. I'm not playing fanboy, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm inspired by them. And that, that's how it is. If I ever get to be on like the Ed Milet show or whatever, or Gary B, I can hold a conversation because I'm not impressed by anyone. I'm just inspired, which is a beautiful thing, by the way. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm making this vlog right now. So I carry this camera around with me. I'm make, making the third episode right now. I just kind of document. It's called Life, in, uh, Life of an Entrepreneur. 
And I was driving home last night from this office after listening to that show. And I was kind of ranting on the camera. And I was like, you know, it's cool to be there, like you're saying, because it's inspiring. And you go, oh, that's what life is like if I add a zero, basically. Um, but so many people, I think they're just like, they're like deer in headlights. Like, oh, this. And I, I compared it to porn. It's like porn is... I can't do the thing I want to do. So I'm going to settle for watching other people do the thing. I That's want. That's crazy. Do. Yeah. Right. And yet there's people that they're in that room for hours and hours, and hours, and hours. Just not me. Listening. They're not making any money. Yeah. I was in there for like probably 20 minutes. I caught some good stuff with Grant about um, that inspired me. Like, yeah, you know what? I need to go harder into doing some bigger real estate deals. Cause you just, the networks, the relationship. I, I heard that too. That was a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. And then I'm like, I gotta go. I got, honestly, I'm, I'm building a course. I got work to do. And I dropped out, but I, you, you know, and then I was like, it's kind of what you're saying. The impress is like it, it, the success as a spectator sport. Like, I just want to watch and see. And, and, no. and, and when the longer you do that, the more it kind of pushes you down because you're, you're putting success up on this mountaintop. Instead of like you say, just going, oh, that looks cool. I'm gonna go get me some of that, you know. Which I'm not saying that's how you should respond can, to, yeah, to porn, and, but and, you know, the way I see it is, you know, I'm a baby in the game of entrepreneurship. I'm a baby. Like I just started this. I started this. Uh, I, well, I, be, I I finally like became successful because everybody's an entrepreneur, right? Like you know, you're flipping cars, you're flipping clothes, right. whatever, right? But I. I became a successful entrepreneur in 2015. So I'm going to be six years in that, that I haven't even, I don't have any, I don't have a decade under my belt yet. You know, right. you know, and I, I want to see, I, I'm so excited because you know how it happens in entrepreneurship, right? It's like, there's so much resistance the first, you know, the first year, maybe even three years, whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For some people, five, 12, whatever. There's so much resistance early on. But then once you break through and you figure out a few formulas, things start to, start to, they start to move and they start to fly, right? From the marketing, from the hiring to the systems, to the, you know, the, the money you're making and the money you're spending on, on your own businesses and scaling, right? Things just start to fly and you start to manifest things, right? In a matter of days or weeks, yeah. you know? It like if you, so said, if you said, I'm going to make a course and this course is going to make me multiple figure, like multiple seven figures, brother, you can make that course in two weeks and have it out mark, have it out in the market. You know, you're marketing this course in a matter of a few weeks and then you're bringing in money in a matter of a few weeks. You see how quickly things run now, how quickly we manifest things now as successful entrepreneurs. Well, you got to get through that. Eat, I call it the, uh, the eat, eating shit phase, yeah. you know, the eating shit phase, right. Where like everything's going wrong and you want to quit and you don't know if this is going to work. And you know, you're eating shit, like you're eating, you know, ramen noodles, you know? So, you know, so, or, and, and microwave, you know, dollar, dollar menu and right. You're eating crap, you're broke and you're struggling. Right. So you get through that phase. It could be six months. It could be 12. It could be three years. You get through that. You'll fly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so true. And to kind of wrap that back to the personal development conversation, if I can say this to everyone, the, the thing about money, because like, like Carlos, like you said, when you don't have it, it's, it's your primary fixation. It's all you what you got to realize money is going to do it is, is it is just going to magnify you. When you get... If you have 10 times as much money, you're going to be 10 times as much as you are. I so love if that. You got, if you got flaws, those flaws are going to get 10 times bigger too. I love that. And so instead of saying, well, I got to get money first so that I can start working on personal development. Why the hell do you want to even waste the energy to get the money to magnify your, your flaws so that you can go do personal development to fix them now that they're 10 times bigger? Well, fix them now. T T so they don't Becker's, get magnified when you get the money, right? Yeah. T. Harvecker says that money only amplifies the person you are. So if you are a piece of crap, then guess what? You're going to be a bigger piece of crap, a bigger douchebag, right? But if you are a, a servant, a, a, a humble human being, and you just want to make the world a better place and, you know, you want to make your life better and, and those around you, like your, your immediate family and friends, well, guess what? You're going to make that world better. So 
uh, you know, I, I love, you know, okay, this is what I do love about money. What I love about money is the resource aspect of money, mm. oh, yeah. right? Somebody needs help, done, right? Something needs to happen. Uh, you need to buy something for someone, right? Your family, whatever, or, you know, somebody passes away and you got to help out, done. Mm -hmm. You see, I love that. You want to try to build some houses in South America, done. You want to build a school or an orphanage somewhere, you know, in, in, in South America, Central America, done. See, you want to adopt some families for Christmas, Thanksgiving, done. See, that's what people need to love about money. Money, right? The Bible literally says money, the, the lust, not, not money, the lust, right? In an unhealthy way, the lust for money is the root of all evil because that's what makes people do bad things, right? But respecting money and, and, and respecting for the tool that it is, uh, th that, that, the way I see it, brother, is, you know, I'm not a slave to anything. I'm not a slave to, I'm not a slave to anything. I'm not a slave to uh, bad habits. I'm not a slave to money. I'm not a slave to, you know, to uh, a sex addiction. I'm not a slave to anything, right? Money is my slave. Yeah. Right. Money works for me. I don't work for money. Money works for me. I make the money. And then guess what I do? I put it out into the market and then it starts working for me. You know, it's working my medical companies, my software companies, my real estate companies, my education company. And I'm just sitting back and I'm like, man, I love you, money. You are a great partner in this business. Right. Thank you for bringing me back more. You see what I'm saying? So people need to understand that that's all money is. Money is just energy. Money is just it's just energy. Right. It's an exchange of energy. Why do people hire me as a mentor? Right. They pay me a good amount of money. And then what do I do? I give them my energy in helping them build a seven figure real estate company. See, that's that's the there's an exchange of energy there. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's what people need to understand about money is money is a great thing. and It's a great tool and it's a great resource, you know. But guess what? More importantly, you have to make a decision, like a real commitment of do I really want do I really want to be successful? Right. Most people, just like you said earlier, like, yeah, most people think they want success, but few are few, few are committed to success. Most people want it. Few are committed. Yeah. Let's uh, real quick. We'll talk about that word commit and then um, we can we can wrap, unfortunately, because I, I know you have something coming up. I unfortunately have a, another appointment in 10 minutes. Well, I feel like we're just having like we're just at a coffee shop. I know, dude, literally. I'm like, why can't this why can't we just be sitting at lunch? We talk all day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that word, you know, people talk, people say I'm committed. What does that word committed mean? What does it mean when you have someone committed? You want, you want me to tell you my perspective on that? Well, I'm talking about like, if you're like, uh, yeah, so I'm calling the state. I need to have my brother committed. Okay. He's gone nuts. Mm -hmm. That's why you're having him committed commitment. Like to, to people that are quote sane, what real commitment looks like is not, no, it's not sane. It's not normal. So a lot of people say I'm committed. If you seem remotely normal to other people around you that aren't committed, you're not committed. When you're really committed, there's going to be a lot of people who aren't committed asking what's wrong. What's wrong? What happened? You know, it's, it's a, it's a whole other level beyond where I think a lot of people use that term. I think that term has gotten kind of watered down. You know what commitment means for a person like me with my upbringing? Hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my life on the line. That's what, that's what commitment means to me. I'm going to put my life on the line. This is a matter of life or death. Yeah. Like I'm either going to make it or I'm going to die. Yeah. Like that's what commitment means to me. That's what commitment meant to me. And it still means to me now, right? It's, it's different now because I'm no longer in that survival, right? Uh, phase, but that's what it meant for me when I became very obsessed. Why did I become obsessed? Because my life was on the line. Yeah. My life was on the line, man. I was tired of being broke. I was tired of being, you know, I was tired of that life. But it's I interesting. Mean, it's interesting for you to say that because you're making $70,000 a year. I know a lot of people that make $70,000 a year. They don't feel like their life's on the line because they make $70,000 a year. But yeah, well, guess what? I mean, everybody's expectations and standards are different, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew, cool. brother, I used to cry. Like, I used to cry. And ask God, like, Lord, I don't want to leave this earth without me using my, my potential. Like, I don't want to see you one day 
and and you tell me like, hey, Carlos, like I gave you all this potential and, and you didn't you use like 20 percent of it. And I feel like working a nine to five job, that's what was happening to me. So I felt very trapped mm. because I'm like, I want to maximize on my God given potential. I want to leave every single ounce of my potential on this earth. And that's when I that's when I be, made a decision to be committed to becoming successful. Honestly, that's a perfect, I think that's a perfect exclamation point on this conversation right there. Um, I already know people are like, oh, wait, this has to end. That sucks. How do I get more? So how do people go get more Carlos Reyes? Where should they go? Uh, You know, the easiest way to find me is at Carlos Reyes on Instagram, right? At Carlos, C-A-R-L-O-S-R-E-Y-E-S, at Carlos Reyes on Instagram. I'm the only Carlos Reyes with the blue check mark, so... I'm very easy to spot, okay, on Instagram. And you know what? Reach out to me. Reach, tell me you heard me on this show and I'll send you a free book or something or maybe a free course. Like, I want people to really start taking that first step towards becoming financially free. Amen, man. I think we're, I think we're doing what we do for a lot of the same reasons. Uh, this has been incredible. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful. This is a, for everyone, this is the first time I've gotten to meet Carlos. I'm, I've loved every second of it. Thank you, uh, I've gone 20 minutes over the allotted time for the interview because I just didn't want it to end. Um, this, seriously, this has it, been wonderful. It's such a, it was such a great conversation, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is this is a good one. I uh, I'm really grateful for you. Grateful for the connection, and especially I have to say, grateful as always to the audience, the viewers, and the listeners of the Millionaire Secrets Show. You guys are incredible. I'm so inspired every day by the number of people that are coming into my world expressing sincere desire to grow and evolve and and like carlos just said not meet their maker one day with untapped potential oh. beautiful and i'm grateful to be a part of all of your journeys thank you so much for being here carlos any any uh, parting thoughts you know just you get one life and uh it's a lot shorter than people think right and uh, i just want them to really try to be the best versions of themselves while they're alive you know mm-hmm. i don't want them to be on a uh, be on their deathbed at some point and have regrets and more than likely, right? Statistics uh, through a bunch of nurses show that the regrets that people bring up on that deathbed are the things that they should have done and didn't do. So uh, make sure that you get out there and just make it happen. Just you know, roll the dice on yourself and see what happens. Who cares if you fail? Who cares? Again, in my opinion, you're only gonna fail when you quit. So if you roll the dice and you you fail. Who cares? Like, get back up, keep going. You're going to learn something from that, from, from that failure. Keep going and watch what happens if you just persevere. You know, that, that's it. That's all I want for people. Amen to that, team. Regret is more painful than pain. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Carlos. Thank you again, everyone. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.